says romance itself being the expression of love is a celebration. Romance isn't a chore, a responsibility, or something imposed on you from outside. Romance is a celebration of the life you live as part of a couple. It springs naturally and joyfully from inside of you. If you'll give it access to your creative energies, have you ever yelled, I love you, at the top of your lungs to your lover? Try it. It's exhilarating. Try it indoors. Try it outdoors. Try it on a roller coaster. Try it while singing at a karaoke bar. Try it on a mountaintop. And listen to the echo. Say it over and over again. Romance is the appreciation of two people who are celebrating the lucky coincidence that they found each other. Catherine Komaroff writes, Every night, the hare and toad watch two particular stars who are husband and wife wave to each other. These two stars are the eternal young man, the celestial cowherd, and his beautiful unchanging wife, the heavenly weaver girl. They now lie on opposite sides of the celestial river, the Milky Way, but they have not always been separated. Once their marriage was an ideal courtship which seemed to have no end. They passed the time gazing contentedly into each other's eyes. The weaver girl's loom collected dust. The cowherd's flocks were unwatched. But the other gods punished them for their neglectful behavior and separated them. Only on one day each year, the seventh day of the seventh month, is the heavenly weaver girl allowed to cross the celestial river to visit her amorous husband. Her bridge is a curious one. It is composed of magpies who gather together to support her fragile weight. Should it rain on that day, however, the birds will leave to seek shelter. And the saddened lady must wait another year before she can see her husband. Every day, each goes to the edge of the celestial river hoping to see the other. But they never even get a glimpse. For the distance is too great. And the glaring reflections of the other stars in the river are too strong. Gregory J.P. Goddick in his book Romance 101, Lessons in Love, says, Many of us have a love-hate relationship with intimacy. We want it. We need it. We chase it. We lament its loss, and yet we fear it. We run away from it. Why? The price of this emotional closeness and vulnerability is too high, and the risk is great. But what about the rewards? It goes on to say intimacy is a feeling, an experience that is only alive in the moment. This is why intimacy is possible only in committed relationships. It takes most of us a long, long time to master the art of staying in the here and now. We keep slipping into the past or the future. We get nostalgic for the intimacy we experienced in the past. We dream of intimacy to come in the future. For most people, creating intimacy is much easier than sustaining intimacy. Why? Because creating intimacy only requires an immediate need and short-term desire. Whereas sustaining intimacy requires commitment. One of the most eloquent pieces I've ever read on the subject. Sophie, Sophie Burnham writes, It comes as an ache so deep you're torn apart. And it has nothing to do with being alone. For you're in a room full of people. And you quickly take another drink or laugh too loudly at a silly joke or flirt outrageously with the manager elbow. Anything to flee the loneliness. It comes at unexpected moments as a wrenching sickness of the heart. You look at your marriage partner across the dinner table, wonder tearfully what is wrong. Because you're not supposed to feel so detached in the company of one you love. Or you look at your new baby and wonder why, even holding her, you feel detached. Loneliness is a gnawing at the heart, a hollow emptiness akin to, but different from, depression. Emily Bronte, the famous author of uh, Wuthering Heights, who lived on the empty English moors, suffered excruciatingly from the canker of loneliness. Poets have written of it. Musicians evoked its dark contours. Alone, alone, all. All alone. Alone on a wide, wide sea, wrote Samuel Taylor Coleridge. A 
A relationship that comes to an end is never an easy thing. For the most part, I really don't believe there is such a thing as a clean break. At least not in the immediate aftermath. One person may have orchestrated the breakup, of course, but the other may have fought for the relationship bitterly. Right up to the bitter end. I think this show tonight is more for that person who suffered the most than who might still be suffering a breakup. Bruce Fisher writes, Ending a relationship may be the greatest emotional pain you will ever experience. The pain is so great, in fact, you may be punishing yourself by playing the if-only game. If only I had listened more. If only I hadn't become so angry. If only I had made love to him every time he wanted to. Bruce Fisher goes on to say, I hope by now you've satisfied your need to punish yourself. I suggest you let it go. You might think what he's saying is easier said than done. I don't think so, as you'll soon see over these next few hours with lovers and other strangers. From CHFI FM 98. Fisher goes on to say, but then here is another concept to help you understand what went wrong with your relationship. Many people ask, why did so-and-so get a divorce? Sometimes a more relevant question is, why did that couple marry? Many people marry for the wrong reasons, such as to overcome loneliness, to escape an unhappy parental home, because everybody is expected to marry because they think that only losers who can't find someone to marry stay single. Out of a need to parent another or be parented by another. And the old standby, because we fell in love. Lovers and other strangers.